Hello, my name is Joyce Raimondo. I'm an artist and I'm the education coordinator at the Pollock Krasna House and Study Center. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about self-portraits in modern art. And um, then you'll have a chance to draw or paint your own self-portrait. I'm going to show you many different styles and approaches to the subject of self-portraits and actually exploring the question, who am I? Okay, so let's get started. This program is hosted by the Polly Krasna House and Study Center, a national landmark in East Hampton, where I'm the education coordinator. And you can visit the site um, in person. We open up in the spring. Go to pkhouse.org to plan your tour if you're in the area. Um, also, you can see our many other virtual programs that we have available by visiting our events page. All of the virtual programs are free. So let's talk a little bit about Jackson Pollock and Lee Krasner, two of the most important artists of the 20th century. A married couple who were part of a group of artists known as the Abstract Expressionists. What is Pollock doing that's so unique in this picture? He's dripping paint from sticks. He places the canvas on the floor. He works from all four sides. He's using house paint instead of um, art paint, right? He's letting the paint literally flow. One mark leads to the next. So I'm going to share with you some of the ideas behind Pollock's work but I really invite you to interpret all of the artworks that I'm going to show you for yourself. So here is an early portrait of Jackson Pollock from 1933. I want you to look at the portrait and think about what words come to mind when you see this portrait. And there's no right or wrong answer. Many people see the portrait um, and they'll say it's haunt he looks like he's haunted or disturbed, deeply troubled, right? Why would we get that impression, right? What about him looks like he's troubled? Well, for one thing, the face is, is ensconced in darkness, right? With highlights of reds and, and whites and yellows coming out on the right side of the face. Also, the face is actually distorted. The jawline, for example, and the uh, rather the cheekbone has those very, very harsh, dark lines as edges. It's very, very angular. The eyes are very, very deep set, very, very dark. Pollock was influenced by the Mexican muralist Orozco, who used a similar color palette in many of his artworks with this deep contrast. But all of these things lead us to believe that there's something troubling going on with Jackson Pollock. And in fact, Pollock did have his troubles. He was an alcoholic and he knew he had an addiction problem from a very young age and he sought medical treatment. At one point, he was even hospitalized. Eventually, Pollock became 100% sober, not touching a drink for two years. He moved from New York City with Lee Krasner, his wife, well, they were a couple. They married shortly after moving to the east end of Long Island in 1945. They moved to an area called the Springs East Hampton. Pollock worked in an old barn, which is now part of our national landmark. And as I showed you, he's working in the barn, dripping paint from sticks. This is his period where he is 100, while he's doing his drip paintings, he's sober, right? This is when he, he creates his groundbreaking drip paintings. And here is an example on the right, which also has elements of collage. We see screens and different kinds of objects embedded into the paint. Now I want you to look at the painting on the right what kinds of words come to mind when you look at this painting? Everyone's going to see it differently. Some people say the painting is lively, it's joyful, it's free. Other people, sometimes when they look at Pollock's 
uh, drip paintings, they think it's chaotic or confusing. So everyone, you can see it in your own way, okay? Pollock says, I want to express my feelings rather than illustrate them. An illustration is a picture that tells a story. It has images of recognizable things. An illustration might have a person, a face, right? A character doing something, a setting. It might show weather or place or time of day or season, right? Um, the clothing that a person wears in an illustration can also give clues. But in Pollock's drip painting, we don't see a face or a person or anything recognizable. It's direct expression. Pollock's inner self is coming out through the paint. He's tapping into his emotions, his unconscious, his energy. He says it's energy made visible. It's like he's one with the painting. He's moving as he's painting and his movement is recorded in the final image. Today, when you make your self portrait, you can choose to paint something representational like the image on the left. You can paint your face or you can make an abstract art with lines, shapes, colors, and textures like the image on the right. This also is a form of expression, expressing your inner self. I left out some of the labels on this talk so that you can really see the work with and not being encumbered by the title. You can see it just with fresh eyes as a visual experience. Next up, we have Lee Krasner, Pollock's wife. Lee is known as one of the most important artists as of the 20th century as well. Lee managed Pollock's career and he catapulted to fame during his own lifetime. That the details of the story of their lives will we go over in other talks. This talk is focusing on self portraits. So when you look at the portrait on the left of Lee, what do you notice? What would you, what do you notice about her? What kind of impression might you get of this person? Well, for one thing, we see she's posing herself as an artist. She has brushes, her rag, her apron, and she's holding the brushes very, very firmly. And they're pointing actually towards the canvas, right? Now the look on her face, you can interpret in different ways. Some people might say she looks very strong, very serious, right? Very, um, determined even. And in fact, I would say those words describe Lee's personality very well. Um, Lee did not have it easy being married to Jackson Pollock because he was, a, you know, an active alcoholic at many years during their marriage. And he died when um, he was 44 years old in a drinking and driving in 1956. And one other, two people were in the car. Edith Metzger died. She was a passenger. And his mistress, Ruth Kligman, was in the car. She survived. But this portrait was made long before that. This is 1930. Lee starts out as a young artist, like Pollock, painting herself in a, in a somewhat realistic style, right? Painting what she sees. She puts herself surrounded by nature. And you will see throughout Lee's career as an artist, that the theme of nature is certainly expressed in many of her works. Um, and even in her abstract art, it has a feeling of nature or suggests natural forms like leaves and flowers and things like that. Now, surprisingly, the image on the right, take a look at it. What's the feeling in this one, do you think? Certainly you see a figure, but it's much more abstract. Many people say this is exuberant. It's filled with life. There's bright colors, the deep pink against the green and the orange, uh, the yellow, right? And all those swirling lines, it looks lively. But then we see the faces, it's ambiguous. It's not clear what the faces are expressing, right? Lee actually made this painting, Sun Woman One, after Pollock's death. 
And I wonder, why would she create an image like this after her husband died? We don't have any set answer to that question, but we can think about it. And based even on our own experiences, sometimes we could project our own experiences into the painting. So for me, and this is just my own personal interpretation, I wonder if the life is actually coming back into her, right? During the grieving process, right? The life is, is there, it's springing forth. Maybe even it's a new time as painful as it is to lose your husband. Maybe it's a birth, it's a new time in her life as well. So for me, I see it a little bit maybe as regeneration, but that's just me. Oh, you can see it in your own way. Okay. Now, Vincent van Gogh is one of the most important artists um, in modern art. And we're going to continue this in a moment. Going to continue the screen share. Sorry about that interruption. So Vincent van Gogh, these are two self portraits and it's a wonderful contrast. Now Vincent van Gogh is called a post impressionist. He really is the, the um, you could say he is one of the early artists who's expressionist. He is imbuing his paintings with a sense of emotion and imagination. And uh, the colors become very, very vivid. The brush strokes become very clearly pronounced with dashes and dabs and swirls. I want you to look at the portrait on the right. How would you describe his expression? Many people say he looks forlorn or weary, tired, maybe even sad. But I want you to look closely what would give someone that impression. Look at the eyes. Look at the furrowed eyebrow. Look at the color of the eye with that little dash of red near the tear duct in the right eye, right? Now, when you make your self-portrait, really very subtle aspects will give an expression. So if you are drawing your face or painting another person's face, you want to think about the position of the head. In these two, it's a three-quarter, as well as the position of the eye, the eyes. Is the person looking straight at the viewer? Are they looking away? Are they looking down? What is, what is the eyebrow, what are the eyebrows expressing? Right? All of these things are going to give expression to the person, of course. But what's also amazing about Van Gogh is his use of color. So the one on the, the portrait on the right, it's filled with warm colors. His beard is a deep reds and rusts, right? Warm colors like fire. The one on the left is cool colors. It's icy, it's cold. And his whole body, is actually surrounded by these, this, these cool blues. And you could also see the cool blues in his face itself. The body seems to be solid, but at the same time in both portraits, it's also fading and commingling with the background because of all the brush strokes. So we also see in Van Gogh's um, paintings, you could say you could see his energy his mark making, right? His brush strokes, his movement. But with Pollock, the movement and the mark making is the painting in and of itself, right? But we could see it starts here with artists like Van Gogh. Edward Monk, the famous The Scream, also an early expressionist artist working around the same time as Vincent Van Gogh. Now we can see the, the figure here. How does this person or this, this figure feel? One might say terror or fear or surprised, 
right? Scared, anxiety. But how does he get across that feeling? And this is a key idea. First off, he's distorting the figure, right? The face is exaggerated, the, the hands are on his ears, the body is swirling like it's in a, a wavy, like in a dream. But also the background itself, the setting actually is expressing the inner life of the main character. So even if the character wasn't there, you would know that this painting is about fear. We see the wavy lines, we see the black against the orange. Right now we could see color is very, very free. The artist mark again is very, very free. And Edward Monk is projecting his own feelings into the picture. And then the picture is expressing to us the, the story behind the main character really. But it's as if we're in the main character's world. So we all know when you're feeling fearful, the entire world looks like a scary place, doesn't it? Right? When you're feeling happy, the world looks joyful. Now, there's a lot of ambiguity in this picture. What do I mean by that? Many things in the picture can be interpreted in various ways. So, for example, the, the black uh, lines in the upper left, they could be people. But you could look again and they could be posts. But let's assume they are people. Are they frightening people who are following him? Are they menacing? Or are they just two innocent people nicely walking along this bridge? We see the water is overwhelming. It's as if this wave, a tsunami is coming up onto the bridge, right? The sky is a red, red orange. And um, Monk writes in his journal that day, the sky was blood red, right? And then how does he get across the idea of the scream itself? One way is he has his hands on his ears. It suggests sound, but it's as if the sound is echoing through nature. We see all of those wavy lines, right? Um, this painting, we could talk about just this painting for probably an hour because the narrative is so... Um, there's so much to see in the picture and so many different ways of interpreting it. For example, the face itself look like, looks like a mask. It's as if he can lift the mask right off, right? So the more you look, the more you see. And I invite you to look at all of the pictures I'm showing you today. Look at them again following the class. You can easily find these online. This is Edward Monk, The Scream. And, um, take a good look at it once the program is over, okay? So we're gonna take a break and I'm gonna stop the share for a moment and I will be right back. Okay, so let us continue. Um, here we have three self-portraits by Pablo Picasso. And this is a very good example of different approaches to the self-portrait, in particular the face. So we see the early self-portrait in 1899. It does have expression. It also clearly looks like Picasso. His likeness is very evident, right? And he's um, drawing light and shadow and he's basing the portrait on what you would actually see, what he looks like. And it also has expression, but the expression isn't pronounced. 1901, um, Picasso paints this portrait, and I want you to look at it. How would you describe the person in that picture or the overall feeling in the picture? There's a feeling, most people say he looks a little grim, right? And you can see he's, his cloak, he's literally cloaked in black, right? And the black is heavy. It's very heavy. In the background, it's all blue. And even his pale face 
has the blue shadows emphasize. It's like his face is ghostly and cold. Picasso is in his blue period where he's mourning his the, the death of his friend. And you can clearly see his sadness and his sense of grief in this picture, right? So how does a person express a very intense emotion like grief in art, right? One way is you can use color to express um, a, a strong emotion, even when the portrait is of a person and it has a likeness of the person. But on the portrait in the right, the larger portrait, um, Picasso, you can still see it, it kind of looks like him, um, but it's much more based on pure expression. The entire face is like a mask. And of course, Picasso, many of his faces throughout his career um, look like masks. He was inspired by indigenous people's masks from around the world. And the shapes are simplified, right? The shape of the eyes, the shape of the nose, et cetera, right? The colors are no longer tied to reality. No one has a green face, right? No one has eyes that are so completely different left and right. The painter is free, free from observed reality, right? And the mark making also expresses. So there's scribbling, there's dots, there's angles, there's crisscross, there's an intense coloring with the red. You can actually imagine his hand going back and forth coloring in that red. So all of these aspects um, are, you can push, let's say, you can exaggerate them to emphasize the expression and the feeling in your picture. Don't worry about if it looks like you. So Picasso, you'll see in many of his portraits, not only his self-portraits, he is projecting his own feelings into the picture, right? He is also, when he's painting another person, painting her or his feelings as well. It goes both ways, okay? This painting was, this drawing rather, was made um, shortly before he died. So you could see that it's almost like he's staring into death, but he's still intensely filled with life. That's my interpretation. Juan Moreau is a surrealist artist working in, um, from Spain. And you can see these free flowing lines. And again, the portrait has a likeness of him. Um, the actual expression in the face is exaggerated somewhat. He has pursed lips. His eyes seem to be staring out. But what's really noticeable about the portrait is that you have all these wavy lines and in the on the surface, there's a, a texture of soft grays and yellows. And then there's all of these various types of, let's say, images and designs that look like stars and suns and maybe bursts of flames. You can interpret it in many, many different ways. So here it's as if we're going into the artist's inner world, into his dream and his, sub his subconscious. Surrealist artists, which means more than real, are interested in tapping into the inner self, the irrational mind, the, the realm of dreams, of fantasy, of imagination, right? Um, the unconscious. Now, Moreau creates this self-portrait in Paris when he was in exile from the Spanish Civil War. So you can imagine how difficult that was. And I think that this portrait expresses his inner life at that time. You see often in Moreau's work, this celestial imagery of stars and constellations, things like that. And Moreau said he found solace looking at the night sky. The vastness of the night sky gave him peace. And I think we can all relate with that as well. Salvador Dali is also a surrealist artist, but very, very different than Moreau. Moreau is painting free-flowing lines 
although still highly composed, but it's this idea that you let the image flow from you. Salvador Dali is also tapping into his inner world. He sometimes puts himself into a trance and whatever he sees in his inner mind, he paints faithfully. The main difference is that Salvador Dali is using realism to paint these dreamlike images. So what do I mean by that? For example, this strange self-portrait face that's that's being stretched and pulled, right? We can tell it's him. He has his, his signature mustache there, right? And it says soft self-portrait, right? But it doesn't really make sense. There's bacon on the platform. And the, it's a contradiction. It's like this soft, gooey material that the face is made out of is being held up by these sticks. So it doesn't actually make sense, does it? But the part that, let's say in quotes, is realistic is the fact that he's using modeling light and shadow to make this dreamlike image appear very real. It's very, very detailed. We see every shadow of the sticks, for example. We see the modeling of the soft material of his face. The bacon itself is very realistic, right? The cast shadow upon the box, etc. cetera, okay? So that's the kind of, in a very simple way, the two trajectories of surrealism. Frida Kahlo is a Mexican artist who is now very, very famous around the world. Frida Kahlo paints her um, story of her life in, in, at times, narrative paintings. But she's best known for her self-portraits, such as this one. Now, in many of Frida Kahlo's images, you're going to see her in pain. You're going to see her um, after surgery with very, very, um, sometimes almost gruesome imagery. Uh, Frida Kahlo paints all the events of her life. And one of the traumatic events in her life is that as an older teenager, she was in a bus accident and a metal rod went through her pelvis and um, caused her she was bedridden for much of her life and um, had to undergo, I think, over 40 surgeries throughout her life. But I chose this one because it really shows um, a story in her life, but with imaginative features. And this is key to the way Frida Kahlo paints. This is also a masterful narrative painting. A narrative painting tells a story. So we have here, Frida Kahlo in the center. We can look at the way she's posed. That might tell us something about her. We can look at the expression on her face, the position of her eyes. We can look at what she's wearing, right? That might give us a certain impression. The way her hair is styled. And she's holding a flag. It's the Mexican flag. She shows herself in two places simultaneously. Now, if you look at the right, what place is that? Look for clues. The clues are layered. She has the American flag. Yes, it's in the United States. She has the Ford factory, which is in Detroit. So she's giving us location. On the left, she shows us Mexican, the pyramid of the sun and the moon. And she literally has the sun and the moon above the pyramid, right? But how does she feel about these two places? At this time, Frida Kahlo came to Detroit with her husband, Diego Rivera, the famous Mexican muralist. How did she feel about living in the US? Well, clearly, in my opinion, she wasn't happy about it. She puts the American flag in a smokestack. And then she shows these robotic, robotic sort of characters. It's as if the people are robots on the right. They're all the same. They're in a procession, it appears to be. And the buildings don't look very inviting, right? And if you look closely, you'll see on the bottom, she has these electrical items with wires. You follow that to the left in Mexico, that imagery chains into plants, the roots. She's rooted in Mexico. She appreciates nature. 
She celebrates her Mexican heritage. And you will see this in many, many of her portraits. So clearly she's not at home in the United States. She doesn't feel at home in an industrial environment, right? And where Frida Kahlo lived in Mexico, she was surrounded by plants and her garden and her pet monkeys and her parakeets and her animals. And as I said, she was um, really celebrated her Mexican roots and her Mexican culture. So you can find many of these themes in her portraits, but I think this one in particular is good for beginning art students because it shows how you can create a narrative with the pose of the figure, the clothing, the objects, for example, the Mexican flag, the setting, right? And then you could put elements of fantasy, but Frida Kahlo says, I don't paint my dreams, I paint reality, right? She is painting the true story of her life, but telling the story with elements of imagination. For example, we can't really see two places at the same time. This is in her mind, this is in her memory. So what I would like you to do is to choose one of the approaches of the art today and draw your own self-portrait. So let's start from the beginning, I'm gonna break it down. You can paint a picture of your face, you can even use a mirror, but I'd like you to imbue it with a sense of expression. Tell us something about yourself. You can make an abstract picture, as I said, with line shapes and colors, right? You can even play with the paint, see what comes out. That in a sense is a self-portrait in the sense that you're expressing yourself. It's abstract expressionism, right? Um, you can push the expression, like in Picasso here, as I said, right? Um, you can be free, free up the color, free up the lines, free up the imagery if you choose to. And um, you can create a surrealist portrait where you paint yourself a dream in a dream, right? You can let lines and images flow out, see what comes out. Or you can paint a nar uh, draw a narrative painting. It doesn't really, you don't have to worry about your drawing skill. If you choose to paint like Frida Kahlo or draw like Frida Kahlo, I want you to just think of a concept. So for example, if I was painting that, oh, I was a little girl, I was sad because I was sick on Halloween. I might put myself in bed with a thermometer to show I was sick. And maybe I would have pumpkins floating around me to show that I was sad, right? So it's a true story with an element of imagination. So I hope you enjoyed this talk. And um, I am going to check back with you to see what artworks you came up with if we are doing this um, on Zoom. And if not, enjoy the project. I hope it inspires your curiosity, your creativity, and most of all, your self-expression. Thank you.